Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. So subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. And you can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku as well. Now let's discuss the implications of today's MPC decisions. I'm now being joined on the news at 10 by the Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rewani. Thanks a lot for joining us on the news at 10. Smiling better today. I yeah. mean, the last time you were here, you talked about status quo economics. Yeah. A little shift, was that enough for you? Not a little shift, mm -hmm. a major shift okay. directionally. What has happened is that the MPR was left at 13.5% unchanged. But a lot of balls were being juggled at the same time. The smart thing that was done was that the tightening cycle started. What had happened was that there was an increase in money supply. There was a drastic reduction in treasury rates. And the rate of inflation was also increasing. So what the central bank did smartly was to immediately start tightening again. Not by using the interest rates, but by using the CRR, which is another ball that was being juggled. By increasing the CRR by 500 basis points, you've actually taken the total amount of money taken away from the banks from, a, from 6 trillion to 8.1 trillion. In other words, the tightening cycle has started again and interest rates are going to go up. And that's one way of dealing with inflation. Well, when you talk about inflation, the reality is that we had food inflation, we had headline inflation, and we had core inflation. Central Bank identified the fact that food inflation was a major culprit, but core inflation is inflation minus seasonalities, which means that as, apart from the Christmas season, apart from the border closure, and apart from the base year effects, inflation was already running out, out of control. And the Central Bank has said that at 12%, inflation becomes growth retarding. In other words, you had a trilemma, which means that you had growth, you had currency weakness, and you had... Uh, inflation. So what the central bank did was to say, look, we can keep the currency stable. We can deal with, we have allowed some growth, even though sluggish, but more, than, more, more important is how do we deal with inflation? And if inflation is as a result of money supply saturation, let's take some money out of the system. So what have they done? They've taken 1.8 trillion more or less and put it at zero cost from the banks. So though Treasury bill rates have come down. You will now find that from today, the banks are going to be running after looking for money, and the interest rates in the banking system begin to go up. Not as much as it was in the past, but definitely it changes the direction of interest rates. Now, what are the implications of this? If you look at border closure, which is a critical thing, the government has said that when the three countries come together with an, and secure our borders, and the customs rise up to the occasion, then we will see the border will be reopened. But most important is that what has happened to some of those food products? Imported rice since the border closure has gone up by 70%. Frozen chicken has gone up by 50%. Frozen turkey up by 43%. Local rice up 40%. Vegetable oil 28%. Pasta up 20%. And palm oil up by 8%. On the other, non-food items, tissue paper has gone up by 10% to 4,350. Detail up by 6%. And most significant is Duracell batteries. have gone from 180 Naira for four batteries to 1,500 Naira. So sorry, before you move to so those who are listening tonight who would like to say to you, is the border closure good or bad? Because the jury is out among economists about that. Just quickly, before you move on. You cannot close the border permanently. You... It addresses certain issues. One, the petrol, um, excess petrol subsidy and all of that. So that deals with that. It also helped to kind of contribute towards uh, product, production and productivity. But on the other hand, it creates shortages. And the, one of the reasons why people are importing goods through Benin and Togo is that they have single window container clearance system. In other words, you can clear your container in Benin Republic or in Togo within 24 hours. 
while the same thing, it will take you 20 days or so to collect in Lagos. So, and then to get to a proper port and out. It is not necessarily out of smuggling, but because of the convenience and the cost efficiencies of going the other way. So in net net, we are going to have to deal, do something and the border will be open after the guarantees are given to the government. Now, coming to the trilemma, which we talked about, growth, inflation and currency, we know that the choice here is that some growth, curb inflation and keep the currency predictable. But if you take a look at the food basket, which is the most important thing here, because there's what we call cross elasticity of demand. If the, if the price of one product increases, the price of its substitutes will also increase because people will shift from that product to a substitute. So what has happened? Because the rice, price of rice has gone up, people now bought yams and gari, and so the price of gari has gone up by 21% to 10,000 naira per bag, and the price of yams have gone up by 17%. But having said that, the complementary goods, which are the things that you use to prepare the broth for, like tomatoes. Uh, for the, uh, and tomatoes down 20%, pepper down 16%, vegetable oil down 8%, and egusi down 40%. 40, 40 of course, onions went up. So generally speaking, we are seeing rational economic agents taking positions accordingly, but not net. What we, this decision by the central bank to frontally attack inflation, one, to make the currency stable and predictable will lead to what we call cautious optimism. So what are you going to have? In Q4, you are going to have growth that is much better than Q3, but not enough to, cap to actually exceed our population growth rate. So moving in the right direction, but not that strong. We, inflationary pressures will continue because the VAT thing is going to start on February 1. The minimum wage has already kicked in and there's still some excess liquidity in the system. Finally, external reserves declining, but not dangerously low at this point. The Naira remains stable as far as we're concerned and the oil price will likely trade between 60 and 62. So All right. fairly, let's say, cautious optimism. Thank you so much. Thank the CEO you. of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rawani. Thanks for doing that in the time you had on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Let's cross over to Abuja now. Here's Maokbe Ogun Yusuf. Maokbe? Hello, Ijoma. It's good to see you. We welcome our viewers to our Abuja studios. Now, there are growing concerns over the rise in the cases of Lassa fever outbreak in more states across the country. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control says at least 24 deaths have been reported since the beginning of the year, while 398 suspected cases have been confirmed in more than 10 states. Lassa fever is an acute viral illness which is often associated with high morbidity and mortality. It has both economic and health security consequences. According to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the country recorded the largest ever number of outbreaks with over 600 confirmed cases and over 170 deaths in the year 2018. In January alone, new cases of Lassa fever have been reported in various parts of the country. From the south-south region of Delta State, government officials have confirmed two cases while in Edo State, 175 cases have been recorded with eight deaths. Our target is that as we work with you, we will not have outbreaks like this again. And for today, we want to make sure that we do not cross what we already have. In the Southwest region, the Ikiti State Commissioner for Health, Dr. Mujusalaya Yakolade, says the state has put in place preventive and proactive approaches to check any possible outbreak. But then in Ondo State, deaths have been recorded. Moving up and in the northeast region, the story is not different. Three deaths have been confirmed in Bochi State, while Borno State has recorded its first Lassa fever death this year. We received a patient at the University of Medical Teaching Hospital. All the necessary protocols for the approach and management 
of patients with such illnesses was put in place. Unfortunately, however, we lost that patient even before the morning. And in the southeast, one person each has been confirmed dead in Enugu and Abia states. Members of the journalist. The northwest region is also battling with the outbreak of the disease. Three persons have been confirmed dead in Kano State. What has happened is we are finding more cases. The Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Hikwazu, however says the agency is working with the state governments to contain the spread of the disease. We don't have a vaccine uh, for Lassa, but there have been some successes. You know, the current uh, case fatality ratio, i.e. the number of de deaths that we see from Lassa, has gone down to 16-17% uh, from 25% a few years ago. We've had a, a significant reduction of the number of healthcare workers affected over, over time. While the government and relevant agencies continue to prevent further spread of Lassa fever, Health professionals insist that personal hygiene must be sustained at this time, while food items must be put in rodent-proof containers. Away from health now to legal matters, all the parties involved in the demolition of the Saraki family structure, popularly known as Ilia Rubu in Ilorin Dikora State Capital, have agreed to settle out of court. Lawyers for both sides told the High Court judge in Ilorin today that a meeting has been fixed for January the 27th to iron out the differences. The trial judge, Justice Abiodu Adibara, commended both sides for wanting to give peace a chance and adjourn till March the 2nd for the report on the settlement. The Kora State government had on January the 2nd demolished houses on the land which it claimed had been wrongfully appropriated by the Saraki family patriarch and elder statesman, Chief Olushola Saraki. In reaction, the Saraki family sued the state government. But on January the 15th, Justice Adibara advised the parties in the suit to explore all avenues of out-of-court settlement. And the United Kingdom court today fixed a timetable for the hearing on the federal government's application for a review of the judgment on the failed PNID oil deal. The federal government lawyers appeared in the English High Court for a scheduled case management conference for a decision on whether or not procedural issues relating to Nigeria's application to set aside the arbitral award of $9.6 billion fine was procured by fraud and corruption. According to a statement from the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation, with the timetable set by the court, PNID has 28 days to respond to the application for the extension of the time to challenge the arbitral award. The statement adds that the timeline is another positive milestone in the Federation's fight to overturn the award of the fine. The London Commercial Court had in a judgment delivered on August the 16th, 2019, validated a London Arbitration Panel's award of the sum of $9.6 billion against Nigeria and in favor of PNID. The federal government had since instituted a series of legal actions to have the judgment overturned. <laughs> 